If you grew up in the 90s and you're watching this channel, there's a pretty good chance you were a big fan of Nicktoons. And if your parents were cool with it, you probably remember watching Ren and Stimpy and thinking that this was something different. In a world of morals and lessons, the Ren and Stimpy show didn't preach anything, and its unique style would help us usher in a new era of cartoons. But as significant as it was, it also had more than its fair share of hardship and heartbreak behind the scenes, and we're here to tell you all about it. Hi, I'm Joe with Channel Frederator, and today we're looking at the creation and history of the Ren and Stimpy show. Do you still sing happy, happy, joy, joy? Are you just wondering what the fuss was about? Either way, we've got something for everyone as we count down 107 facts about Ren and Stimpy. Let's get started. Number 1. The Ren and Stimpy Show premiered on August 11th, 1991 on Nickelodeon. Number 2. August 11th is a significant date if you're a fan of classic Nicktoons. It was also the premiere date for Rugrats and Doug. Number 3. Each show shared a producer that greenlit the project, Vanessa Coffey. If you're a 90s kid who loves Nicktoons, you owe this woman a lot of credit. Number 4. According to Coffey, the president of Nickelodeon at the time was hesitant about Red and Stimpy. Coffey said that if it didn't work, Nickelodeon could fire her. The the president gave her six episodes. Since we're talking about it here, I think it's safe to say the gambit worked. Number 5. Until Coffee and these three shows, Nickelodeon mostly played cartoons they had acquired but not originally produced. This was a big step in the company's history and the creation of Nicktoons. Number 6. Coffee likened these three shows as part of a balanced meal. Doug was broccoli, the Rugrats were spaghetti and meatballs, and the Ren and Stimpy show had the honor of being dessert. Number 7. The Ren and Stimpy show came from the mind of John Crickfalusi, who we're going to see a lot of in these facts. He's important to the story of Ren and Stimpy. He created the show with his studio, Spum Co, which he co-founded. Number 8. Crick Felucci dropped out of college to work in advertising and from there found his way to working on cartoons. Number 9. During his time working as lead animator, he grew dissatisfied with the way characters were traced from model expressions, saying that it didn't allow for a complete range of expression and emotion. And Ren and Stimpy is certainly big on expressions. In talking with Huffington Post about why studios might be reluctant to move to a more off-model style, he said, it's not because it's time-consuming or costs more money. They just didn't understand it. The animation industry has a lot of talented people, but the system doesn't exploit the talent. They just have this formula, and everybody is forced to use it. Number 10. Stimpy's design came from a cat featured in the Tweety Bird short, A Gruesome Twosome. Number 11. Ren's design came from an Elliot Erwitt photograph of a chihuahua in a sweater. Number 12. Crick Felucci drew inspiration for Ren and Stimpy's relationship from the Three Stooges and Laurel and Hardy, saying that he gave the team intense flexibility to tell whatever kind of story they wanted. There is a critical difference, though. If if you were a kid in the 90s, Ren and Stimpy was a hard sell, whereas your parents wouldn't have batted an eye at the Three Stooges. Number 13. While your mom and dad may have thought the show was far too gross for a children's audience, the show drew impressive ratings for Nickelodeon at the time, a 5.8 soon after its launch, compared to the average rating of 2 from other Nickelodeon shows. Number 14. Crick Felucci believes in part that the show's success came from giving kids what they really wanted. He said, You don't want to get morals in your television shows, movies, and cartoons, yet everyone wants to give them to you. There are non-stop authority figures. My idea was to give kids at least half an hour off every week when they don't have somebody telling them what to do. Number 15. The success of Ren and Stimpy didn't go unnoticed by other studios. Almost immediately, similar shows began to crop up, including Two Stupid Dogs and Schnookums and Meat. Number 16. But it wasn't just clones. The show helped launch a new era of animation. Beavis and Butthead creator Mike Judge credited the show in part for paving the way for more varied cartoons. Number 17. For all that legacy, Ren and Stimpy were originally smaller parts of a larger project. They were originally pitched as part of a show called Our Gang that featured a live-action host introducing different cartoon shorts with different characters meant to lampoon genres of cartoons. Ren and Stimpy were a parody of dog and cat cartoons. Vanessa Coffey, the producer the show was pitched to, didn't like the overall concept, but liked Ren and Stimpy enough that they put them in their own pilot. Number 18. But the creation of Ren and Stimpy actually predates their pitch in Our Gang. The characters were first designed by John Kay in college. I can only wish I did something so iconic in college. Number 19. The pilot for the show went over well despite any grossness, and Nickelodeon bought all rights to the show and ordered 13 22-minute episodes. Number 20. Billy West, the prolific voice actor behind Philip J. Fry, Dr. Zoidberg, and Professor Farnsworth from Futurama, was brought on to play the well-intentioned but intellectually stunted Stimpy. Number 21. As for the emotionally unstable Ren, that role initially went to John Crickfalusi himself. Initially. We'll get back to that later. 
Theater. Number 22, Ren and Stimpy live in the wonderful world of Hollywood, Yugoslavia. I suppose that's why they never meet up with the Animaniacs on the Warner lot. Number 23, if you're even a little bit familiar with the Ren and Stimpy show, you're probably familiar with the song Happy Happy Joy Joy. What you may not remember is the name of the artist that spawned this lovely song. His name was Stinky Wizzleteats. Number 24. If you only have a passing familiarity with the song, you might not know that Stinky Wizzleteats also interrupts the song on multiple occasions to say pretty disturbing and disjointed things, such as, I told you I'd shoot, but you didn't believe me. Why didn't you believe me? Number 25. It turns out that these quotes are taken from the songs and movie clips of folk singer and actor Burl Ives. Stinky Wizzleteats was inspired by a real person. Number 26. Okay, so Stinky Wizzleteats has a real-life inspiration. But who wrote the song? It was actually written by John Crickfalusi, along with Chris Riccardi, who also worked on the show. Number 27. Ren and Stimpy uses a good deal of classical music in the background. So, before saying that the show is uncultured, remember that you can hear some Beethoven in it. Take that, parents. Number 28. Ren and Stimpy had animators guide the story and scenarios of each episode, rather than traditional writers. Crick Velusi believes that if you want to make good animation, it needs to be led by animators. I can respect that. Number 29. The team drew most of their creative inspiration from cartoons of old. Crick Velusi, in particular, drew a lot of inspiration from Bob Clampett, who worked on Looney Tunes. Number 30. One major difference between the styles of John Kay and Clampett? John Kay said he thinks he has a harder time writing short stories because he likes to explore the psychology of his characters more than Clampett did. He said he doesn't deliberately try to distinguish himself from Clampett, though. It's just an ordinary case of developing your own style by looking at those that inspire you. It's a pretty good lesson for creative folks to learn. Number 31. Because of the vast differences between the Ren and Stimpy show and typical cartoons of the time, Spumco had to spend a lot of time training artists to move outside the comfort zones of model sheets. Number 32. The strategy proved successful. So successful, in fact, that in 1993, the Los Angeles Times ran a story with the title New Kings of TV's Toontown. Number 33. The Ren and Stimpy team included a number of ridiculous commercials for fake products, like Powder Toast and the original Log by Blamo. Everyone wants a log. Number 34. On his blog, John Kay claimed that the commercials were compelling enough that some kids actually went to the store in hopes of buying products that didn't really exist. Number 35. The reverse supposedly held true as well. John Kay created commercials for Old Navy, and apparently they were so well received that the kids were looking for the whole cartoon. It was also a boon to Old Navy sales, but we're more interested in the cartoon side of things. He actually developed it into more of a cartoon, too. Number 36. John Kay believes that allowing direct sponsors on cartoons would be a good way to help to fund them. Unfortunately for him, the FCC has some pretty strict guidelines on advertising to children. Number 37. Ren's full name is Ren Hook. Number 38. Ren's not the only Hook to get time on the show. We also get to see his cousin, Sven Hook. Sven, however, shares a lot more in common with Stimpy. Number 39. At one point, Ren has a dream to develop huge pectorals, possibly to act out his anger more effectively. I'm not sure on that last part, but it would certainly fit his character. Number 40. John Kay said that Ren's voice was a bad imitation of Peter Lorre. Peter Lorre was an actor in movies like Casablanca and The Maltese Falcon. Number 41. In the episode Sven Hook, we learn that Ren has a rare collection of incurable diseases. We see jars for cowpox, scabies, and black plague, so don't get on his bad side. Number 42. Ren should really spend more time with his intellectual pursuits, because while all three of these maladies are real, they can all be treated, cured, or vaccinated for. See? The show doesn't go too dark. Number 42. In the segment, Ask Dr. Stupid, Stimpy gives kids all across the world the real reason they have to go to school. It turns out your parents are aliens, and when you go to school, they shed their skin and breathe drier lint. Now you know. Number 44. Stimpy's full name is Stimson J. Cat. No idea what the J stands for. Maybe it's like Harry S. Truman. Number 45. Stimpy is a cartoon icon for a lot of people, but who's his television idol? It's Muddy Mudskipper from the Muddy Mudskipper Show. Number 46. Ren and Stimpy are both veterans. They join the army in the episode aptly titled In the Army. They manage to graduate from training and become full-fledged tank troopers. There's also a brief moment where they are peeling a hydrogen bomb. Don't think too hard about that last bit. Number 47. Ren, for all his meanness, does have a soft side. He decides 
decides to become a fake dad. Yes, the show uses that term to a lovely boy who turns out to be a convict in prison for crimes against humanity. He's even sad when his boy has to go back to prison. Aw, Papa Ren. Number 48. Stimpy might be a cat, but for an episode, he disguises himself as a dog. He and Ren become fire Dalmatians and earn golden fire hydrant helmets for their bravery in the line of duty. Number 49. Stimpy invents a form of mind control. With it, he can control how happy Ren is. It's actually super horrifying, but we'll forgive it because it led us to happy, happy, joy, joy. Number 50. In the Ren and Stimpy world, there's a live-action drama titled Commander Hook and Stimpy. The spacefaring duo bear a striking resemblance, not to mention names, to the characters we're here to watch. Number 51. Ren and Stimpy enjoyed a number of cameo appearances. They appeared as cartoons on The Simpsons, though I don't think they are as popular as Itchy and Scratchy. Number 52. That said, John Kay was often critical of the style of The Simpsons, so in The Simpsons episode, episode The Front, Ren and Stimpy are nominated for excellence in writing, but when they go to show a clip, they simply show a screen that says, clip not done yet. Ren and Stimpy did have trouble finishing episodes on time, so it's a pretty biting comeback. Number 53. Still, they were eventually able to let bygones be bygones, and John Kay was invited to create a Simpsons couch gag. Number 54. The character Wooldor from the show Drawn Together is a parody mix of Stimpy and SpongeBob SquarePants. Number 55. Tiny Toons Adventures got in on the Ren and Stimpy cameo fun with the character Rank and Stumpy. They also parodied Beavis and Butthead in the same breath. Number 56. A fun legacy left behind by Ren and Stimpy? Gross close-up shots. If you see a shot zoomed way in on a character with bloodshot eyes and unkempt facial hair, you have Ren and Stimpy to thank in part for that. Number 57. Ren and Stimpy, with its tendency to buck trends, didn't always have a neat and happy ending. They end up getting eaten by a monster, imploding, and more. Number 58. The show isn't known just for Ren and Stimpy. It had a number of other memorable characters characters, including Powdered Toast Man. Powdered Toast Man might not sound like one of the mightiest defenders of the Earth, but he saved both the President and the Pope. Hey, it's more than Batman's done. Number 59. Powdered Toast Man usually flies backwards, which probably has something to do with the fact that he can launch into flight from putting his head into a toaster. Number 60. When Powdered Toast Man saves the Pope, it's a pretty standard case of saving him from TNT. When he saves the President, though, well, the President is caught in his own zipper. Yes, really. Number 61. How does Powdered Toast Man know that the President is in need of zipper assistance? Well, when Washington calls, his toast particles dissipate and send him directly to the White House. It's implied that only Washington has the ability to summon Powder Toast Man this way. Number 62. Unfortunately, Powder Toast Man is no stranger to unnecessary collateral damage. He burns the Bill of Rights and the U.S. Constitution and roasts a hot dog over the flames. Number 63. As you might imagine, hijinks like burning the Constitution didn't sit terribly well with parent groups or Nickelodeon. Censorship would become a constant battle between Nick and the creative team of Ren and Stimpy. Number 64. A few facts ago when I said that Powder Toast Man saved the Pope, well, that's only sort of true. Nickelodeon didn't feel super comfortable about it and had the cross removed from his hat. In the credits, he's referred to as the funny little man in the pointy hat in later airings. Number 65. It probably didn't help matters that Powder Toast Man asks his holiness to cling tenaciously to his buttocks. I mean, do you want to be saved or not? Number 66. This Pope, or I guess the funny little man in the pointy hat, was played by music star Frank Zappa, and it was the last time he would portray a fictional character. Number 67. Censorship was a sticking point for John Kay, who felt that Nickelodeon reduced the impact the show could have had due to their meddling, and he would complain and fight it. In one edit, he was asked to remove a fictional commercial break in the middle of an episode because it didn't make sense. He wrote back, but cats can talk. Number 68. A Huffington Post article brought to light another editing note for your giggling enjoyment. We have two instructions for the episode Son of Stimpy. Can't say Stinky Butt Fantasies and Can't Say Butt Buddy. Number 69. The most famous case of censorship in the show was for the episode Man's Best Friend. In the episode, Ren and Stimpy are adopted by George Licker. It turns out George Licker is an abusive owner. Ren gets pushed to his breaking point and beats the owner with an oar. The violence was enough that Nickelodeon decided not to air the episode. Number 70. The episode was finally aired, however, as sort of a lead-up to the revival of the Ren and Stimpy show, Ren and Stimpy Adult Party Cartoon. It's not the most violent thing you'll ever see on television, but you can pretty easily see why the Nick execs at the time were uncomfortable. Number 71. 
Nickelodeon was also unsatisfied at the pace Bumco could turn out new episodes. John Kay blamed Nickelodeon's slow approval process for causing delays, but it was clear that bad blood had developed between the two entities. Number 72. Between production delays and arguments of content, Nickelodeon decided they had had enough, and in 1992, John Kay and his studio were taken off the project. But the drama doesn't stop there. Number 73. Nickelodeon, while concerned with some aspects of the show, did appreciate the talent that went into it, and attempted to hire away animators to continue making the show. John Kay described watching Nickelodeon take the show and talent as watching your children be kidnapped and abused. Number 74. In an interview with Howard Stern, John Kay stated that he tried to keep his studio together, hoping that if nobody went to work for Nickelodeon, they would be forced to negotiate different terms. Crick Velucci stated that they hadn't only sold him out, but had set cartoons back 10 years. Number 75. One of the people who agreed to work with Nickelodeon after the fallout? Billy West, who not only kept his role as Stimpy, but also picked up Ren's voice, taking it from the show's creator. Number 76. The Howard Stern interview brought West and Crick Velucci together in 1995. It is, as you might imagine, an uncomfortable interview. In fact, uncomfortable is a gross understatement. Number 77. Because he stayed behind, Billy West is the only actor to appear in every single episode. Number 78. It's easy to think poorly of Billy West for the whole event, but in an interview, he talked about how hard it was to work under the direction of John Kay. According to him, in most voice acting jobs, you might read a line three or four times. With Ren and Stimpy, he was asked to read lines as many as 20 times. Doing that much voice work can really put a strain on you. Number 79. Vanessa Coffey, who initially produced and ordered the pilot for Ren and Stimpy, also recalls difficulty in working with John Kay, saying that over time, playful disagreements about content became bitter and aggressive. Number 80. Sometimes, it's good to let bygones be bygones. For the 2003 reboot known as Adult Party Cartoon, John Kay offered Billy West the role of Stimpy once again. The two would voice the characters they originally started with. Number 81. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. Billy West declined to be part of the project, and so the part went to Eric Bauza. Number 82. With John Kay and Spumco out of the picture, the show continued under the leadership of Bob Camp and Games Animation. Camp said that it was a move that was good for everyone, but I suspect that it was a move that was especially good for him. Number 83. Under Camp's leadership, the show continued to run for a total of 52 episodes over five seasons, ending in 1995. Number 84. Unfortunately for everyone earning royalties on the show, the team had hoped to produce 65 episodes, which is typically the bare minimum number of episodes a show needs to be syndicated. Number 85. If 65 episodes seems like an odd place to draw the line, well there's a reason for it. 65 episodes gives you enough material to air one episode each weekday for three months. If you have a favorite cartoon that produced exactly 65 episodes, this is why. Number 86. Either way, the legacy of Ren and Stimpy lived on. Marvel produced a Ren and Stimpy comic in 1992. Maybe they'll make their way into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Number 87. The Ren and Stimpy Show also enjoyed several video game adaptations with titles like The Ren and Stimpy Show Vidiots, Ren and Stimpy, Space Cadet Adventures, and Ren and Stimpy, Stimpy's Invention. Number 88. The most recent video game title to feature Ren and Stimpy characters in Nicktoons MLB, which was released in 2011, 20 years after the initial premiere of the Ren and Stimpy show. If you've ever wanted the uncanny experience of watching Nicktoons playing baseball with normally proportioned humans, I have some very good news for you. Number 89. As mentioned, the Ren and Stimpy show attempted a revival in 2003, Ren and Stimpy Adult Party Cartoon. It aired on Spike TV, where censors were less likely to interfere. Fear. Number 90. In the initial Ren and Stimpy show, there were questions as to the ambiguous relationship of the two titular characters. In Adult Party Cartoon, the ambiguity is gone. Ren and Stimpy are officially a couple. Number 91. In the absence of censors, the show, as you might expect, leaned harder into crude humor, perhaps too far. Critics and fans didn't warm up to the show the same way. Excluding the premiere of Man's Best Friend from the original series, Adult Party Cartoon only fully produced six episodes before cancellation. Number 92. John Kay didn't love how the humor turned out, claiming that Spike mandated more gross-out humor, saying, I wasn't given license. I was kind of forced to. I just wanted to make it the way I always did. The stories even came from the first two seasons of the show, but we added stuff that the executives thought would be more like South Park. There are a few scenes that I would take out if I had my own way, and I never tried to be merely crass, certainly nowhere near as crass as modern primetime cartoons. Number 93. But even through all of the adversity, Ren and Stimpy's legacy doesn't end with adult party cartoon. One character from the show managed to survive and get his own spin-off, 
George Licker, American, number 94. John Kay described George Licker as so conservative, so right-wing, he thinks the Republicans are commies. Number 95. George Licker is based loosely on John Kay's father. He's also said everybody knows somebody like George. There's a lot of everybody's dad in him. Number 96. And where does George Licker's colorful name come from? While driving, John Kay came across a liquor store with a sign that simply said George Licker. John Kay knew right there on the spot that he needed to make a character with that name, so he went home and drew up the character. Number 97. George Licker went on to star in his own show, The Goddamn George Licker Program. It primarily followed George and his nephew, Jimmy the Idiot Boy. Number 98. The Goddamn George Licker Program is considered by many to be the first cartoon produced for the internet. It was produced in the late 90s, way, way before that would become a regular thing. Number 99. The Goddamn George Licker Program never got quite the attention or praise that the Ren and Stimpy show got, but good old George got to flex his sponsorship muscles. He was used to promote Tower Records. Number 100. But starring in one show isn't enough for George Licker. In 2012, John Kay launched a Kickstarter for a show called Cans Without Labels, starring George Licker once again. Number 101. Cans Without Labels is based on John Kay's father and his tendency to aggressively save money by purchasing damaged, labelless cans from the supermarket. According to John Kay, these cans pretty much always had gross food in them. Number 102. While it's not as good as a cartoon, Ren and Stimpy are still getting love today in the form of merchandise. Pop Animation released new Ren and Stimpy figures in December 2016. Number 103. There is a voiced and storyboarded episode of the Ren and Stimpy show called Life Sucks that was never fully produced, but internet sleuths can probably find it online. Number 104. Despite all the hardship, John Kay earned an Annie Award in 1992 for Outstanding Individual Achievement in Animation for his work on Ren and Stimpy. Number 105. The Ren and Stimpy theme song actually has a name. It's called the Dog Pound Hop. Not that I love cats, but I feel like Stimpy gets spurned with that name. Number 106. The theme song, like most of the original music in the show, was composed by the show's staff. Man, they were writing, animating, and composing. Is there anything the team didn't do? Number 107. When speaking with the Nerdist podcast, Billy West said that a scraggly kid came in and wanted to record a song for Ren and Stimpy. The song wasn't accepted, but the musician's name? It was Kurt Cobain. Once again, I'm Joe, and thanks for watching 107 Facts About Ren and Stimpy. Is there a fact that we missed? Be sure to let us know below in the comments. We have new videos dropping every week, so if you have an animated TV show or movie you want us to cover, let us know and subscribe to Channel Frederator, your cartoon central on the internet.